there. Welcome to commercial zoning training. I want to introduce myself first of all. My name is Mike Lee. You might have seen me before in Jackson Systems uh, nomenclature, information online, whatever. Uh, but uh, tonight we're going to specifically talk about some changes that are occurring with Jackson Systems in terms of the commercial products. Um, and so I'm here today as a representative from Specified Controls, uh, which is the commercial wing of, of Jackson Systems. So um, we're going to talk about commercial zoning, and there's a few uh, just housekeeping things that we need to talk about. Uh, first and foremost, we certainly uh, thank you and welcome you uh, to the training, but we want to remind you that you can ask questions. You can log in through the uh, the app there and, and just type your questions in and we'll be happy to answer those live. Uh, we ask that they be decent questions, not just, you know, like, where's Joe? Because uh, he's here as well to join us. Uh, but uh, we'd ask you to do that. And then uh, as far as the availability of this training uh, for watching later, uh, it'll be available tomorrow with the same link that you used to get here. So uh, please uh, know that you can share that link and others can watch this uh, starting tomorrow. So we'll go ahead and get started uh, with commercial training uh, on zoning in particular. So specified controls, as I said, is the commercial wing of the manufacturing part of our company. Um, and we're going to start out by talking about zoning from the perspective of we want the one on the left. <laughs> okay? So we want to be able to control temperature to different set points throughout the space. We don't just want one temperature, all right? So how do we get there? Well, the first thing is let's talk about zoning from the perspective of a big space. Let's say the entire floor of an office building, as an example. In this example here, what we're showing is one VAV box controlling five, six offices, OK? That's what is somewhat typical out there, right? So on a one floor, you might have five, six boxes. And we're controlling temperature to a point. We're zoning to a point in terms of, hey, I got this one box, but everybody in that office is not very happy. One person might be happy, or two people might be happy, but some of the others are not. That happens in our own office. For the staff that's here from Jackson, you know how many people I'm talking about that have heaters underneath their desk because they're not very happy. And we're a zoning company. So uh, what we're trying to do is get to this, right? And the difference in this layout versus what we just showed is we don't have a VAV box. What we have is zone dampers throughout the space. And that is what we're going to focus on first. And that is what we would refer to as VVT type of zoning, OK? VVT, meaning variable volume and temperature. But I want to talk about first the difference between the two kinds of zoning we're going to talk about today. So VVT zoning is going to be pressure dependent. It is going to have zone dampers, not VAV boxes. It's going to have zone thermostats, not sensors. It's going to have a bypass damper. Okay, So you'll often hear a VVT system referred to as a bypass system. That's what you'll hear. Um, it's going to have a zone panel, not a controller. It's going to have reheat possibilities, but very limited. Typically only just electric heat, and that's all we can do. Um, it's not going to be able to control an SCR or, or modulate uh, a duct heater. Um, and then it's going to be low pressure only. Uh, in most of the country, most of the systems we're going to come across are low pressure. But if we're in Chicago, New York, downtown and big, big area, we might, we might have a higher pressure system. We might have a, a three you know, three inches of static on a system or more because they gotta, you got to force that air all the way down from the roof, right? So lots of, lots of uh, differences there in terms of pressure, but in this particular application we're talking about, we're talking about low pressure. Um, the VVT concept can be two position or it can be modulating, just depends. So it can be, you know, open or closed or modulate it. Um, and then it's always going to be auto changeover meaning that we have a unit that's going to provide heating and cooling, whereas with a VAV system, we might have a cooling only unit with a bunch of reheat, right? So that's the difference. And then, of course, at the bottom there, I point out VVT is going to be much cheaper than VAV. 
it's typically going to be half the price or less. Okay? So it's a lot different in terms of the control, but it's also a lot different in terms of the price. Okay? All right. So when we're talking about VVT, I want to point out a couple of differences on the dampers or air devices themselves. Okay? So first and foremost, a VAV box is going to have airflow measurement. We are going to measure the CFM or the velocity uh, that's coming through there. We're going to put a, uh, what are you looking for, Joe? I do not have a VAV box up here. There's one right there. <laughs> oh, well, it's right there. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Joe. We, 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 uh, we'll, we'll come to that in a minute. <laughs> um, but it's going to have airflow measurement. Now, airflow measurement, typically what we'll, what we'll refer to it here at Jackson, we'll call it an air cross. Okay? Typically, uh, depending upon the manufacturer of that VAV box, it'll literally be a cross, or it'll look like you see here on the screen, which is uh, more of a diamond shape. Regardless, what we're trying to do is get a clear uh, measurement of the flow of air through that box. Okay? Whereas with a damper, there's no measurement at all, except for temperature. We're measuring the duct temperature. Okay, oops. So the duct temperature sensor that is in a VA or sorry, a VVT damper is going to allow us to dictate whether that damper is open or closed. On a VAV box, it's going to be about flow and how much flow rate we have through that box. And that's the big difference on the air devices. Okay? All makes sense so far. We're all good? So we come to the first question. Okay? So I would like you all to take just a second and think about this. Name the person who patented the algorithm used by most manufacturers who, who have VVT controls. Anybody in-house in, in got a guess? No. Uh, Joe knows because he's related to him. Uh, oops. Where did it go? Where is he? There was, I swear there was a picture of him. It's Ron Jackson, uh, the, the president of Jackson Systems. Ron actually created the algorithm that Train uh, used for the Veritrack, uh, and then subsequently Carrier used for the VVT. Um, he has it patented downstairs on the wall. If, if you walk by, you'll see his two patents. One was from, I think, 89, and one was from 90, right in there, right in that range. Um, but uh, so it's a whole long story, but here's the reality on it. Uh, Ron worked for Interstat. Interstat made all the electronics for train, and you don't sue the company that. Just to enhance the story a little bit, I worked for the train company for 15 years, and one day they sent me out to start up the very first Veritrack system ever sold. I built in Rushville, Indiana, and we installed in Indianapolis. And my service manager handed me the manual and said, Read this, you're going to start one up in the morning. I took the book home and I read it, and it was my dad. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to stop you real quick. Your microphone, no, no, your microphone wasn't on. Say that story again so those online can hear it. It says it's on. Now, now it's on. Okay. So tell that story again. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. So uh, I worked for the train company for about 15 years, and uh, one day my service manager came to me and said, here, take this manual home and read it. You're going to start up this system in the morning. Uh, it was the very first Veritrack system ever sold. They're, they were developed and sold it. They were developed and built in Rushville, Indiana, and installed in Indianapolis. I went out to, I took the book home, read it, and I had to call my dad that night and say, "Well, my employer is stealing your patent," <laughs> and it, it had in fact happened. But like Mike said, uh, the company he developed it for uh, was making all of the uh, thermostats and other electronics for train and. Tr there was going to be a lawsuit, and Train said, fine, sue us, we'll change the algorithm a little bit, and we'll stop doing business. So, uh, that stopped. <laughs> as, as it turns out, they continue to use it, and right. it's somewhat still in it today. So, interesting fact, Ron Jackson patented the concept or the algorithm involved in a VVT system, which really is a majority wins algorithm, is really the, the reality. Okay, so moving on from there, we'll talk about the types of equipment that we would we, we can zone or that we would typically see zoned, right? So when we're talking about VVT, we're talking about unitary equipment in most cases. So we're talking about heat pumps and splits and standard rooftop units. 
uh, you know, a fan coil. That's what we're talking about. When we get into VAV type of zoning, we're talking about applied equipment, right? So when we talk about applied equipment, we're talking about a, a rooftop that is VAV. It, is, is, it comes that way. It's, it's ordered that way. We're talking about VRF, kind of, which we'll get to in just a second. Uh, chilled water, boilers, you know, cooling towers, all that fun stuff. That's where we get into customized controls, and it is not an out-of-the-box solution, right? But the simple answer is we can zone all of it. But VRF is a little bit of a different story, okay? Um, I want to address VRF right now before Joe comes up here to talk about full-blown VAV systems because VRF is an absolute nightmare when it comes to controls, okay? I know out there online you're going to be thinking to yourselves, oh, can we zone VRF? What can we do? We come across this. It's a pain in the butt. Here's the simple reality of a VRF system. It is incredibly difficult to control them. The manufacturers like Daikin, uh, give me another one, Panasonic, whoever else, oh, doesn't like. matter. Um, they have their own controls and most of the time they don't know themselves how to, how to make their, their controls function. What we are capable of doing with control of a VRF system is we are capable of zoning a VRF air handler, as an example, if it can take a 24 volt thermostat. If it can take a standard thermostat, we can zone it, okay? Most do not. In fact, I'm aware of one company that, that just, it's standard that way, and they're actually in Missouri that manufactures it. And I couldn't tell you the name of it, but I've seen them. Uh, now, Mitsubishi, as an example, has a VRF unit that can take a little, let's call it a dongle, that will allow you to then put a traditional thermostat on it. We can technically zone that. But you have to keep in mind that a VRF system, by design, is to zone with equipment. That's what it's for. So it, in most cases, if you look at this drawing here, what we're talking about is these little cassettes. Where's the little pointer on this thing? Oh, well, these, these right here, these little cassettes right here, that's, that's the zoning that is inherent into a VRF system in most cases. So if, if the design or the engineer wants zoning put onto a VRF air handler, that's not really a thing, <laughs> uh, and it's not very feasible to do, okay? So they, they, they offer, Daikin offers it as an example, but the controls are, it's, it's, it's pretty rough. Panasonic has some options. It's pretty rough. Um, it's, it's, it's not a lot different than most of the, uh, the equipment manufacturers that you all know. They're really good at making equipment, not usually that great at making controls. Uh, it just depends on who it is. But um, as far as monitoring a VRF system, that's not a problem at all. We can monitor it all day. It's actually integrating into it and controlling it that becomes more of a problem. So um, we would we would offer up as a company uh, as Jackson Systems that we were we're glad to talk to you about it. We're glad to to offer up a solution if we have one. But when it comes to VRF, it is it's marginal at best. Is that is that a good statement, Joe? Okay. All right. So VRF can be zoned sometimes. <laughs> okay. All right. So as as is the case with zoning most of the time, we have standalone zoning and we have system zoning, where we're zoning the unit itself, okay? Standalone zoning means no control of the unit at all. We are not telling the unit what to do. The unit is running on its own, probably from a thermostat somewhere. But we can do this as a VAV product, or we can do this as a VVT product, meaning airflow measurement and changeover or not, okay? This is typically for overheating or overcooling. That's typically what it's for. Um, the, the thermostat piece for our product is about making sure that it is accurate, making sure that you get the temperature you want in the space. Other manufacturers out there have something similar where it's just a sensor. We want you to be able to adjust it, and that's why we use a thermostat, okay? Um, it, it's, it's, all of our products are gonna be auto changeover, uh, when it comes to that, it'll, it'll heating or cooling, either one, because we're going to just make sure that you hone in right on the temperature you want in that space, okay? And then we have a reheat option where we can control duct heaters if we need to. When it comes to the system, 
that's a different story. Now we're talking about bringing multiple zones, multiple different air devices into one panel that controls the unit. And so what we have there is VVT or VAV, doesn't matter. We got a panel, a controller, whatever it is. Bypass or not is kind of the question there. Does it need bypass or does it not? If it's VVT, it's going to need bypass unless you put a VVT system in terms of controls onto a VAV unit or it has a VFD. And in that situation, I'll just tell you a quick rule of thumb. If the large, or sorry, the smallest zone that you're going to have is more than 20% of the total CFM of the unit, you don't need, you're, you're not going to need a bypass because the VAV unit can slow down to 20%. But if your smallest zone is smaller than 20%, you might still need a bypass on a VAV unit because it's not going to be able to slow down enough to lower that static pressure and we'll get some noise. So just keep that as a simple rule of thumb is, is if your smallest zone is, is uh, larger, or sorry, is smaller than 20%, you got to take some caution. Okay? Uh, voting algorithm based, uh, whether it's a VAV system or it's a uh, VVT system, in most cases we're talking about a voting system where either all of these zones, you know, a, a majority of these zones have called for heating, so we're going to go into heating, or a majority of them have called for cooling, we're going to go cooling. When that's not true is when it's a VAV system, of course, that has reheat. Then we're always going to be in cooling no matter what. We're going to have 55 degree air come down that duct, and we're going to heat the areas that want heat and deliver cooling to the areas that want cooling. Um, as we said, auto changeover is a pretty common thing. Uh, with a system, we're going to have more reheat options because we can modulate the heat if we need to. And then a system is true zoning, meaning that I'm not just providing two or three zones over here to make sure we don't overheat. <coughs> now we're controlling it all. We're controlling all the airflow. Okay? All right. So the second question. We're asking questions today because Tyler made me put questions in here. So what is the difference between Wi-Fi and wireless? And online, if you got any questions or you have an answer to this, what's the difference between Wi-Fi and wireless? Our cameraman's looking at me like, I don't even know, Mike. I don't. Is that like right now? Yeah. So we get this question a lot because it's, it's so interchangeable. That's why this question comes up. But I just want to give you guys a second online, especially, to think about this because just because it's wireless or just because it's Wi-Fi, those are two, two different things. So what, what's the difference? What is it? And on top of that, Nick, you should know this. If you don't know this, we need to go talk. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to give you the, the, the basic answer to this. And the basic answer is this. Wi-Fi is a means to get to the Internet. That is what Wi-Fi is. Wireless is wireless, meaning there's no wires, <laughs> okay? So if a Wi-Fi device is wireless, that can happen. I'm going to use one example of a product. A Honeywell water leak detector is a wireless Wi-Fi product. We, we're getting laughs in here because, yeah, well, it kind of works, it kind of doesn't. But it's a wireless Wi-Fi device. But you can have a wireless device that isn't Wi-Fi. <laughs> and you can have a Wi-Fi device with, in fact, almost all Wi-Fi devices are wired. Okay? Let me see. So I got some answers. Wireless communication between devices, Wi-Fi connects devices to the Internet. Perfect. There you go. That was a simple answer. So that's the answer to that question. All right. So we'll go ahead and move on. I only point that out from a commercial standpoint because um, any contractor on here will know this. Engineers are the smartest people in the room always, and they will always say that they want Wi-Fi when they really mean wireless. And they'll always say wireless when they mean Wi-Fi or BACnet, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Okay? All right. So moving on to VVT, the system that specified controls and Jackson Systems offers. Okay? This is a product that it, for those of you that have used our products before, you know as a Z2000T, or sorry, Z2000 panel. The thermostat is a Z2000T. Same product, 
Just understand that slowly but surely, this will move to specified controls as specified controls manufactures this product and Jackson Systems private labels it, okay? So we're gonna be moving away from that and Jackson will no longer be manufactured, you know, the, the, the labeled version of it, it will be specified controls, okay? Um, locally here, don't worry, you can buy it here all day, it's the same thing. Um, those of you out across uh, the interwebs, um, we'll talk about it in a moment, but uh, there, there are other locations you can get it uh, than Jackson uh, if you want to get it locally, okay? All right, so um, we won't talk anything about this, this picture here, but there's some of the stuff. Um, so standalone and control of equipment is what we're going to talk about in terms of showing you some of the product. Um, so standalone, we still refer to this as a zone one, okay? And a zone one is very simple. Here's your damper. Every damper is going to have a duct temperature sensor in it. I know that's not easy to see. Trust me, it's there. And a thermostat. The most important feature to this is the thermostat. This is where the brain is and this is how it works. It's very simple. Single set point thermostat. There is no programming to this thermostat at all. All you have to do is wire it up, which is eight, eight, connector, eight, eight conductor, I'm sorry, from the thermostat up to the actuator on the, uh, on the damper, and then power it. You're done. That's all you gotta do. And set it to whatever you wanna set it to. And it's a single set point, so there is no confusion by the occupant of what's the heating set point and what's the cooling set point. They set it to 71 or 68 or 74, whatever they want, and you're done. There are a lot of nice features about this thermostat. This thermostat lets you force the damper all the way open, force the damper all the way closed. It lets you uh, uh, put it into uh, a locking feature so that they can't adjust it if you choose to do that. Yes, sir. Can you explain the algorithm and how? Yes. Getting there. Yep, getting there. Uh, the question from in, in the room was uh, explain the algorithm on how, how it, it actually works, which uh, is the next part of this. So uh, the last thing I want to tell you about the thermostat itself is that um, you can uh, put a temperature limit on it. You can do that. And the newest version of this will take a remote sensor. So we now can put a remote sensor on it. That doesn't mean we can average between the sensor in the thermostat and a remote sensor. That means you can put this somewhere else so nobody can adjust it. Been very uh, requested quite a bit that we be able to like put this above the ceiling and not let them adjust it. So we, we now have that capability with this thermostat, okay? As far as the algorithm goes, it's very straightforward and simple. Can you not average it though? You cannot average it. It's one or the other. It's a one or the other. There's a, just a dip switch that says uh, internal or uh, remote, okay? Um, the way this works is very simple. Duct temperature, is we know that on the stat, we know it because it is part of the system. So we know if there's 55 degree air in the duct or if there's 75, 78 degree duct air in a duct or 80, 115 degree, we know what that duct temperature is. We know the set point. So we know where we're trying to get and we know the sensor in the space temperature. So. If we have 72 as our set point, and it is 68 degrees in the space, what do we need? We need heat. So it looks at the duct temperature, and if the duct temperature reads higher than 72 degrees, that means there's heating in the duct, it will open the damper. It will modulate the damper open. Oh, we had a question online. Yes, you can lock out the thermostat. You can lock it in. Um, you can lock it so they can't adjust it. Uh, that is very simple to do. It's in the, the uh, setup of the thermostat, okay? Um, the, uh, the way that the, the, the algorithm is designed to work is to allow the damper to modulate close as we approach set point so that we don't overshoot. So it's just a very simple package that addresses overheating or overcooling as a standalone device. Yes, sir? Conference room. conference room is a great example. Single thermostat in an office building. Everyone's asking for heat. You pile 20 people into the conference room. It sees hot air coming down the duct. It says, oh, this room's already warm enough. Let's not dump right. any more heat air in those folks. Or, or an IT closet would be really yep. good, too. Yep. Uh, the rest of the building's asking for heat. They didn't yep. bother to put in that middle split or right. whatever. So at least when right. it sees warm air coming down the duct, if it doesn't need it, it will close the heat off and, and not right. dump heat. But so, as soon as the cooling turns on, It'll open. 
Yeah. It's designed to be cooling and so so, so to so paraphrase what Joe just pointed out was great application for this conference rooms, IT closets, um, areas of a building where it might typically overheat or overcool. Um, we'll see a lot of these in like uh, offices in hotels, as an example, not very often in there. Um, we also see a lot of these in a retail application like uh, a Walgreens or a, uh, a pharmacy type application where uh, like picture a CVS where you have big open space, all this cooling is getting dumped in there and there's one manager's office and they're freezing. This can solve that problem. So that's just paraphrasing what Joe said is, is, uh, is when they won't put in the mini split <laughs> or they won't put in that small unit, uh, this can address the issues. He's wearing a shirt. Freezing. <laughs> um, she's getting all his cold air. Right. At, at least she can go over there, right. adjust her thermostat, and get sure. cold air. Stop sure. Stop Absolutely. So, to paraphrase what Joe just said, was you know, uh, you, you got a, a, a manager, a owner, a boss, whatever, uh, and his secretary or, or his uh, assistant. Um, the owner might be a very, very big guy that, that, you know, gets hot. And so he's got a lot of cooling going, and she's outside and she's freezing. Uh, we can address it with this product as well. I uh, want to point out that we can also do that as a VAV diffuser. I don't have the plate on the VAV diffuser, but uh, same concept. It's just now we put it in a diffuser, makes it much simpler, cleaner package uh, in terms of uh, the product that uh, is offered. Um, sometimes you can't get to the duct. It's a retrofit application. This makes it easy. You just pull the grill out and put this in. Uh, other times that I, I will point this out, from a uh, design situation is engineers will often spec an AccuTherm thermofuser or a Price Prodigy or a Titus T3SQ. Same thing. Same thing. Never met an engineer that wouldn't accept it. It'll save you money, save you time, and it's much simpler. We did have a question online I think it's important to point out. Uh, Ricardo asked, why are there eight wires? Okay, so it's, it's a good question. Uh, the, the eight wires are uh, you got your heating call, you got your cooling call, you've got your duct temperature sensor, two, two for your duct temperature sensor, you've got two for power, and you've got, I gotta look at it. Because <laughs> uh, we don't label the trunks. Hold on. I gotta I got remember. Where are the other two, Joe? Uh, no, it doesn't really have research. Oh, it's got drive damper open, drive damper yeah, closed. Power up, common. Yeah, power so it's, so it's 24 volts power, uh, power open, power closed damper, Two for the discharge air sensor, uh, heating call, and cooling call. Eight, eight, eight conductors is what we need down the wall. Okay, that's why we have the eight. The brains of this thing are in the thermostat. So that's why we have to run the eight wires down the wall. Okay? Now, if you were to do the remote sensor, you could literally mount this on a diffuser, as an example, right here above the ceiling, and then you could just run the two wires down the wall, and you wouldn't have to run the eight if, 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 that, was, if that was an issue. You could do it that way. Okay? Cardinal, I hope that answered your question for you. Um, Harold says, is there a variable that the stat has to register before it will turn on? Uh, hold on here. i got to see what he, he wrote more to it. Uh, 74 in the duct, the T-stat set 71. Does T-stat have to reach 70 before the T-stat? No, it does not. Uh, Harold asked uh, about, does it have to register a certain value before it will turn on? No, it does not. Uh, it does not have to do that. When it sees a temperature change in the duct or a temperature change in the um, thermostat or in the space, it will it will adjust and, and it will it will begin to do that because the design of this is to modulate and continually move uh, the damper or the blade on the diffuser. So that is not an issue at all. Um, and there we go. I think that's everybody. Okay, so. Um, as far as the dampers go in this situation, just, just know, round, rectangular, doesn't matter. VAV diffusers, whatever size you need, we can do it. We, uh, we, we do, this, do this constantly, so it's, it's nothing, nothing new for us. Mike, Yeah. one of the nice things about the diffuser versus a the thermofuser, the thermofuser, you gotta climb up on the it. desk. Yep. Sorry. So, no, you're fine. So a thermofuser, Joe just pointed this out, I think it's very important to point out, especially online, is a thermofuser or a thermal diffuser, uh, Thermofuser is kind of the, the Band-Aid name or the Kleenex name for a, a thermal diffuser. 
Um, a thermal diffuser uses, I'm not kidding, beeswax. Uses a beeswax actuator, and it relies on expansion and contraction of beeswax to open and close that, that damper or, or that blade inside the diffuser. Um, I'm not a believer that works. I'm not a believer it's very accurate. However, that exists, and you'll see that a lot. The main reason that it's used is because it doesn't require any wiring. It doesn't require any power. It's just moving in on the temperature uh, flowing over that actuator and, it, and it causing it to expand or contract. So um, the benefit to using an electronic version is, first of all, you know it works. You know where, where the damper is. You know what it's doing. Uh, but also, um, it gives you the ability to adjust it. Whereas a thermal diffuser is very difficult to adjust. You actually have to climb up on a desk, open the diffuser, and adjust the pistons, uh, is what I call them, on it. They're not really pistons, but they look like a, a brass piston that you have to adjust. And you have no idea if it's actually accurate or not. So um, electronic diffusers are a much better option. Um, and uh, I think you're going to see thermal diffusers kind of slowly but surely go away. Um, so real quick, just to point out, does require a proprietary thermostat. We do have to use our thermostat with our system, OK? Um, and then we do have BACnet options available, which Joe will hit on slightly, but we do have the ability to tie these in to a system if, if there's a building automation system, OK? All right. So what is the most common application that you see? We already talked about, so we're going to skip that. Um, so I wanted to show you real quick just a wiring diagram to explain uh, what uh, what, how we would wire up a system, how we would wire it up. And that's a little hard to see in here, I apologize. Um, online, they can see it really easily. But uh, let me pull out a panel here. That may be a little better, guys. So um, VBT system, or a Z20 panel, or a Z2000 panel, for those of you that have used it before, is going to integrate all of the thermostats into one uh, panel, one, one, one place. And it's going to take that information from those, those uh, thermostats, which let's be honest, it's taking heating and cooling calls. It's, it's just a, a relay logic situation, really. And what it's doing is it is going to decide what the majority is. That's it. That's all it's doing. There is nothing complicated about this system. This is actually less complicated than a residential zoning system. From the standpoint of, I got these standalone devices, they just wire back to the panel. And now I've got a system. They're still doing their thing. They're just telling the unit what to do. So it's, there's nothing complicated about this. The only thing to point out from a contractor standpoint is it requires home run wiring. It requires you to wire back from every air device to this panel. And that is because we're powering all of them from the panel. So we just need one transformer. OK? That's it. I wish I had more to point out or tell you how this is such an amazing thing, but it's that simple. If you wire this board up, it's just like wiring a thermostat. It's the same terminals. There is nothing more to it. <laughs> I wish there was. I'd probably make more money. <laughs> but there, it's just that simple. So the, 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 what you see in front of you here is very, very straightforward. The panel wires to the equipment, also wires to a discharge air sensor, which we need for safeties. We want to make sure we don't freeze a coil or slug a compressor or anything like that. Um, wires to each air device, and then each air device wires down to each thermostat. Pretty much it. The only other piece to this is down here at the bottom, where you see it says night stat or time clock. I don't think we've sold a time clock for this in five or six years. But we use a thermostat to program that panel to have occupied or unoccupied modes. Basically just have night setback. So we call that a night, night stat. It's a night setback stat. That's all you got to do is program a thermostat to say we're occupied from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and after 7 p.m. Go to, go to unoccupied mode. That's it. So there's, there's really not a lot to this system. It's very simple. There is very little in terms of setting up the panel. On the most current version, there is a total of six dip switches. If you have a standard rooftop unit, you won't touch one of them. 
if you have a heat pump, you'll maybe change two of them. That's it. You don't have to have a computer. You don't have to plug into it. You don't have to have special training. You don't have to have train come out and overcharge you and tell you what they did wrong is your fault. Uh, you don't have to have carrier come out and not know what they're doing. Uh, this is something every tech can know how to do. Oh, oh, Constantino. I know that name. Constantino's, Constantino's always with us. Uh, on the VVT damper, is it closed, complete? How do you set men fresh air? Oh, good question. So Constantino's asking about fresh air in terms of ventilation. Okay. So um, the damper itself, actually you can set a minimum and max. Where did I put it? Oh, you can set a minimum and maximum position through the thermostat. Okay. So we always recommend that every device is going to, every air device is going to say we suggest a minimum of 10% open for your minimum position for ventilation. However, from a balance standpoint, the balancer can go in and he can adjust that to maybe it needs to be 15 or maybe it needs to be, you know, uh, five. I, you know, it just depends on airflow. Um, but I, I can do it. Oh, <laughs> it's disco tech time in here. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the thermostat is where you can set that, Constantino. Very simple. It's, it's, it's literally uh, you step through about three different screens and then you can set your minimum and you can set your maximum and you're done. It's very, very simple to do. Balancers love it because it's simple and easy and they don't have to crawl up uh, to the damper to do it. So uh, very nice thing there. And then, okay. All right, so moving on. Um, the, uh, the last thing to point out here is, I don't care if you have 20 zones, one 75 VA transformer most likely is going to cover everything you'd ever have. So we just always almost put a 75 VA transformer with every system. Whether it's five or 15 dampers, this, this, the standard Bulimo actuator that we use is, is actually two VA, and then the thermostat's another two. So we just always size them at five per, you know, five per uh, zone damper and call it a day. Uh, but it's, it's, you'll never, almost never have a situation where you got to go larger than 75 on the, on the transformer. Okay. Mike? Yes, sir. What if you have more than 20 zones, if you only have a yep. 20 zone panel? So in the two times in the eight years I've been at Jackson Systems, uh, we've been asked to do more than 20 zones with this panel. That is something you can do. Because remember, I pointed out these are all standalone devices that just wire back to this panel. Well... Don't wire the extra ones back to the panel. They're still going to do whatever they're doing. They just can't vote. So if you pair similar uh, uh, load requirements together, they can still have control over their individual temperature, but maybe only one of the three on the west side of the building with the same load gets a vote. And then you can do that. On the other way, the other side of that, I've got 10 zones I'm using and the principal of the uh, law firm that you're zoning has to have what he wants. He has to have it. He, if he wants cooling, you got to give it to him. How do I give him priority? It's very simple. On the panel, I've got 20 zones. I'm only using 10. I just jump her between each zone. Like I could give him five votes. I could give him eight votes. Hell, I could technically give him 10. And he'll always get what he wants. You can actually use just simple jumpers, and it, it, that's how you give them priority. You give him more votes. That's it. Happens all the time. Do it all the time. Uh, it's, it's no problem. Mike, yes, sir. About the wires you need to connect to your input there, the pads. The wires. Yeah. Oh, the four. Okay. Yeah, the four. The four. Yeah. Yep. The question was how many wires go from the dampers back to the panel. Okay. So we have eight eight conductors from the thermostat to the damper or diffuser. From the damper or diffuser back to the panel is four wires. Okay, it's just four. Typically going to be 18 four back, uh, but we just need four conductors back, and that is heating, cooling, and power. That's it. Because we're using one transformer to power them all. So we're, we're running power back to all of them. So just an 18 four strand of wire will work. Um, and, Does and that's it. Take it. special, you have to use shield the cable? We do not. We can use standard thermostat wire. <laughs> Standard thermostat wire is what I would suggest, actually. Um, no reason to pull a bunch of expensive wire when you don't need to. Okay? All right. Justin, you good?
Multi-stage, absolutely. We can do uh, two heat, two cool, st uh, standard, and then three heat, two cool, heat bump. Okay? So we can do it. How's what decided? Upstaging. Upstaging? Upstaging is on a time situation. So uh, we can, and we can, um, uh, we can't change the timing, but basically uh, we'll go first stage, and then if we don't, uh, if we continue to get calls, we'll go to second stage. So it's a time-based algorithm on that. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other questions right now, so we'll keep going. Um, bypass dampers, real quick, just, just to throw it out there. A bypass damper, uh, for those of you that have done zoning for a long time, the old barometric bypass damper, you probably want to shoot yourself after you've set one of them up. Because you've got to go through and you've got to close, you got to open every damper, then you've got to close the damper, then you've got to go back to the bypass damper. And then close another damper and go back to the bypass damper and keep adjusting that weight. Well, on the commercial side of the world, what we see all the time is the sheet metal contractor puts in the bypass damper and he puts it in upside down. So now it just sits open. The other thing we see all the time on the commercial world is the owner of the building, after you've set it all up, goes in and looks at this big weight hanging off the side of the damper and starts playing with it. And now it's in bypass all the time. We are not telling you that you should never use a barometric bypass damper, but we are telling you we have a better product. That better product is an electronic bypass damper. We use, a, just it, it would be basically this damper, a, a Belimo actuator with our static pressure controller that's called an SPC 800, and we use that to allow for you to, to set the static pressure that we want to maintain, and then you're done. That's it. You don't have to worry about going and checking every damper and, 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 and getting a weight right. It's just, it's set up. So from an installation standpoint, let's say 15 minutes to install it versus potentially an hour, hour and a half or more dependent upon the barometric bypass damper and what's going on. So we suggest the electronic bypass damper. Um, this is just to show you what it typically looks like, you know, from the supply to the return. Or, yeah, yep. Yeah. So what, we, what we're doing there. Is, is just making sure that we don't overpressurize the system. That's it. If we do, we will have noise. And that's why we have to bypass. Because we can't typically on a constant volume unit, well, not typically, we can't on a constant volume unit change the volume of air that's coming through. So we have to bypass, okay? Um, I point out here, no barometric. I, I'm just a firm believer that a barometric bypass damper is a bad idea. They never stay configured. <laughs> they just don't. Um, they'll work, but, but I, I would not suggest it. Okay. Can um, you use a VFD instead of a bypass you damper? Can, you can. You could absolutely use a VFD instead of a bypass damper. We mentioned earlier, just remember that rule of thumb about the, the smallest zone. Okay. All right. Uh, yes, sir. Can we uh, use minimum position settings on the uh, damper and you, avoid bypass holes? You could. You could. Um, the question was, can you uh, use minimum position to negate the need for a bypass damper, to get rid of the need for a bypass damper? You could do that. Uh, it all depends on the system itself and the design of the system. So I can't give you a def de definite answer. I can tell you, you could do that. Um, the issue you, that you, you probably run don't into, want to. You though. probably don't want to because you'll run into the issue of this person is too cool, yeah. this person is too hot. Yeah. Overheating and overcooling. So I wouldn't suggest it, but also, you know, we have, we've had systems where there's, you know, there's two zones and they're equal. And we said, well, <laughs> no, no real need for a bypass. But, but so then you oversize the duct a little. You oversize the duct. Yep, exactly. Okay, so wanted to point out alternatives. And I point out alternatives not to say, hey, you could use this instead of ours. I'm pointing out that you could use ours instead of theirs. <laughs> okay? All right. So uh, you might see the company called Zonex which a lot of you might know as California Economizer, same company. Um, but Zonex makes a system very similar to ours. Um, difference being it's a little more complicated it's and their lot, support. It's a lot more complicated. Okay. It's a whole lot more complicated. I wasn't trying to rag on them, but it's a lot more complicated. I will. Um, and also the support, just I'll be honest, I hear from all these different people across the country, the support's not there. So um, uh, Zonex, uh, they have multiple different systems mod 2 and there's a bunch of them but if you see a zone x it's basically the same thing we've been talking about in terms of what it does it's just that ours is a much more simple system and it costs less 
and it's available. <laughs> and we have support. Uh, okay, carrier iView or a carrier VV3 system or a VVT system. Um, carrier iView, if you're not familiar with that, is actually its communicating system. It's, it's got an online presence. It, you, can, you can communicate with it. Um, it's very complicated. It's very expensive. And they charge monthly per, per thermostat or per zone. So it's expensive. Um, it's a nice product. It's just it's, it's very expensive. VV3 is, is their, their updated version of a VVT. Um, and it's, it's, it's exactly what you would expect from Carrier. It's super proprietary, and they will make you pay through the teeth to have a certified technician come out and stand there and not do anything. Uh, Train Veritrack, uh, good product. It's been around for a long time. We all know the algorithm's great, uh, but uh, it is train, and it is what it is. If you, if you put in a train, you can't stop a train, and by that, I've always taken their, their, their motto to mean you can't stop billing because train will just keep on billing for their services. Um, Wattmaster is another one. Wattmaster is a product that has been around for a long time. Um, they have a system that is about as antiquated as you can be and still offer zoning. Um, they actually have a station uh, software that you have to install on a, on a computer in the building that's right next to your unit. It's, it's very weird setup uh, that they have. Um, but it is similar, again, in what it does. It's just much more complicated. Uh, two My, position stuff? Yes, sir. I think the thing that summarizes all those modulating systems are computer-based. Yeah. You have to have software, PC, something to operate it versus uh, you can literally troubleshoot a Z2000 with a voltmeter. Right. Everything is 24 volts AC. There's not even any DC in right. the circuitry. Right. So if, if you didn't hear Joe, um, He's talking about the fact that all the systems I just mentioned are computerized. Um, they have some uh, degree of difficulty in terms of troubleshooting, um, and support is not very well easily available. Our product uh, doesn't have a computer base to it. You can you can literally uh, troubleshoot it with a voltmeter, uh, or you can call in and we can troubleshoot it with you. Um, and uh, it's just it's just simplified. There's no it's all 24 volts AC. There's no DC, as Joe pointed out. There's no so, communication. There's no communication with it. It's just as simple as it can be. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So two position, just to point out, you know, the Honeywells of the world, the, the EWCs, all those guys, we, we also have that option. Um, April Air, uh, we won't get into that story. Uh, but uh, the one I want to point out is Honeywell. That's what you're going to see the most in terms of a commercial uh, spec. You're going to see Honeywell two position zoning all the time. Um, you're going to see the HZ432 panel. Uh, it doesn't modulate. It's not anything more than a residential system that you can just put in to a commercial building. Cost wise, we're going to be competitive and provide a better system than what Honeywell is going to provide. Okay? So, uh, that, little, that little line down there, we are less complicated more competitively priced and far better tech support. The other thing is lead time. A lot of times in the commercial world, lead time can be important and it cannot be important. It just depends on the job. Our lead times are almost always going to be less than a week and in most cases, same day or a couple of days. We stock over 7,000 dampers downstairs uh, that we can provide. We can also build them very quickly. Um, and then the product itself, we stock the, we just built on, okay? This place is huge now. You can't, you, it takes you an hour to walk outside just to smoke a cigarette. It's crazy. I'm, I, I'm, I'm getting exercise when I try to go smoke. It's crazy. So, <laughs> so uh, all right. So uh, just real quick, wanna, we're going to summarize the products that I talked about. The VAV diffuser, uh, very popular product. Um, you're going to see this in... Uh, I won't say every commercial building, but a lot of commercial buildings are going to have one or two of these, and a lot of them are going to have 10 or 15. It just depends on the building, but it's a very common thing that you'll see, uh, and, and I think that if you didn't know that we offer it through Jackson and Specify Controls, we do, and we have a great product that does that. The Zone 1 dampers we talked about, any size you'd ever need, round, rectangular, we got them probably in stock, uh, but we can do any size. I just did a 9 foot by 6 foot. Zone one. I don't even know what the application was, didn't care. Happy to sell this huge damper. 
Uh, electronic bypass damper, again, round or rectangular, doesn't matter, we can do it. And I want to point out that if there is a situation where you have two bypass dampers on the drawings, this is somewhat common for a larger unit, a larger uh, constant volume unit, we do a master electronic bypass damper and then a auxiliary or drone or whatever you want to call it, secondary damper. Again, not allowed to say what we used to call them anymore, correct. All right. Um, we also have a pressure independent zone one product, okay? So when I say pressure independent zone one, that is code for VAV shutoff box, okay? I got a VAV shutoff box that already has in it the programmed controller, the discharge air sensor, and the thermostat. So basically, the difference between what I'm showing you on the screen and what we've already talked about is now not only can we put in temperature set points, we can put in CFMs for cooling and heating for min and max. So this is not a common application necessarily, but we see this more and more where they're saying, hey, I want only 500 CFM of cooling that can go into this space, but I want 1,000 CFM of heating that can go in here, or vice versa. We see this somewhat often for IT closets, where they'll say, I want to be able to put in 50 CFM of heating, or 100 CFM of heating only, but I want 1,500 CFM of cooling. So we see that a, a little bit here and there. So it's just a kind of a new, kind of a niche product, but we do have that, that option. It is BACnet, so it can be tied into a system as well. Um, we also use this as a pressure reducing damper, okay? So if you've ever used thermofusers before, they have a product called a uh, uh, pressure independence module or a PIM. That is a pressure reducing damper. What that means is typically when we have a bypass damper, we're going to open as the static pressure rises so that we can bypass. Pressure reducing damper works in the exact opposite way. Now it's closing as the static pressure rises so that downstream of the damper, the static pressure remains low. And we want that on VAV diffusers. If we don't have low, low pressure on VAV diffusers, they will whistle and sound like a jet engine taking off if we don't keep that pressure down. So same product, PRD, pressure reducing damper, PIZ, pressure independent zone one. You'll learn, if you don't know this, that Jackson Systems and Specified Controls have the most complicated part numbers ever. <laughs> Not really, I'm totally kidding. They're, they are, they're so simple. We sell an exhaust fan controller. It's called an EFC. <laughs> we sell a pressure, uh, or uh, sorry, a, a building pressure controller. What do you think that's called, Rand? Building pressure. Yeah. What, what do you think the part number is? BPC. BPC. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's, really, it's really complicated stuff. All right. So where is specified controls available? From you. <laughs> I, everywhere, no. Uh, so uh, just, I'll go ahead and answer it and, then, and I'll show you this. But Specified Controls is available through Jackson Systems. Specified Controls is available through local reps. If you are in, as an example, Colorado, your rep in Colorado is Long Building Technologies. You can call up those guys if you happen to be already buying the fans or buying the equipment from them. They also have the controls as well. But certainly, uh, I would urge you to talk to your sales rep here at Jackson uh, about specified controls uh, product that we talked about tonight because, as we've talked about, it is the same as the Jackson product, okay? Here's a map uh, that you can see uh, that where the coverage areas are. Um, so if you're local to Indiana, you're around Indiana, other than Chicago, it's, it's, it's Jackson. It's, that's who you call, okay? Um, if you're, as an example, down in Texas and you have a question or you need some help, uh, the guys that maybe at Texas Air Products might be able to help you, or the guys at ADW in Dallas might be able to help you. Um, so just, just know that you can go to the Specified Controls website, you can see this map, you can see where your reps might be. Um, but we are always happy to help you, whether Jackson or Specified. It's all, we're all part of the family, okay? All right. So last thing I want to talk about real quick, BACnet VAV diffusers. For you commercial guys that are dealing in uh, building automation systems. We can take this VAV diffuser and we can make it a BACnet device so that it can be monitored, controlled, adjusted, all that through the building automation system. Okay? It's treated for all practical purposes exactly like a VAV box 
in a building automation system, we're just not measuring flow. That's it. That's all it's doing. Uh, very, very common now. Um, five years ago, when I started selling these, 95% uh, of all VAV diffusers that you saw were just standard non-communicating VAV diffusers. Last year, almost 40% of the VAV diffusers we sold were back net. Okay? So it's going to become more and more common um, where, where they want VAV diffusers in a commercial building that have a building automation system to communicate. Okay? So we have it, great product, very simple to set up, um, and uh, we've had uh, a lot of success with that product. All right, so ultimately, when we're talking about VVT, that's what we want, and that's what we can provide as far as our product goes. Okay? I know this wasn't the most technical of trading. The idea here was to make sure you all knew what we had so that the next one that we do, you could tell all your techs, we're going to actually show them how to wire this, we're going to show them how it works, uh, and we're going to actually do a very in-depth technical training on the VVT type system. So now we're going to move on and talk about VAV zoning, and we're going to talk about that with Joe Jackson, who's going to come up here and, and talk to us not only about VAV zoning, but also about just custom controls in general uh, and how that all works. So Joe, come on up here if you wouldn't mind. And Harold, uh, I just saw your, your, your question. Uh, Harold, I will send you their contact information uh, as soon as we get done here, okay? I'll, I'll shoot you an email with their, with their information, okay? Can we daisy chain BACnet together, Mike? Yes, absolutely. If it's BACnet, that's kind of the whole idea, is, is daisy chaining it. Um, so with our VVT stuff, absolutely, you know, no. With VAV, absolutely, okay? All right, so Joe uh, is going to talk specifically about DISTEC and VAV zoning and how that's all involved. So we'll start out uh, here with just real basic explanation of VAV zoning, Joe. So okay. have at it. So most of the time when we're talking about VAV, uh, we're talking about something that's pressure independent, um, meaning there's an airflow measuring device. And if the maximum airflow is 500 CFM, regardless of what happens to the duct static pressure, uh, we put the right amount of airflow out. So pressure independent indicates that there's an airflow device uh, in the system. So we're running on, on actual airflow. Um, typically, these devices have to be DDC, uh, at least today. Used to be you could do it with pneumatics if you were good enough with it. Uh, but there's usually a temperature sensor, which is not really a thermostat. It's just a communicating device that shows you the, the temperature and the set point. Um, typically, the piece, of e the piece of equipment. Big ass damper. The piece of equipment is uh, VAV, so it's a rooftop unit that has a variable frequency drive and is doing discharge air temperature control, um, except for when you're in morning warm-up, it's typically putting out 55 degree air constantly. It doesn't change temperature. VVT stands for variable volume, variable temperature, uh, meaning it switches back and forth between warm air and cold air. VAV is typically always 55, 54, 53 degree air, and we just deliver that air. Your damper goes closed if you uh, don't want the cooling, goes open if you do. Uh, if you need heat, and it's a shutoff box, which is really just a damper. I wish we'd have brought one up. Uh, which is really just a damper. Uh, there's here. one there. Here, but there, there you go. There you go. So the airflow device reads the airflow, and the damper behind it opens and closes to maintain the right airflow, regardless <laughs> of what is happening with the, uh, with the duct static pressure. So... Uh, typically, these box can uh, these VAV boxes can do heating uh, with hot water, uh, modulating hot water valve. Um, they can do SCR heat or staged electric heat. Keep going. <laughs> um, and they can run they can run relatively high pressures. Um, it's not uncommon to see two, up to two inches of, of static pressure on a VAV box, and that won't bother it at all. Uh, versus if you were using a, a VAV diffuser, you know you're you're running really low pressures. These devices almost always communicate. They don't have to, they're smart enough to run on their own, but if you put 20 VAV boxes or 40 VAV boxes or 200 VAV boxes in a building, then having all that information back to one location is a real time saver. Most of the time we do communication today with BACnet. Uh, we, do, we can do them in, in lawn works as well if it's an older building. Um, the controller for us 
is made by Distech. It has airflow uh, tubes that pick up the air velocity. This guy has a built-in Belimo damper actuator with a with a plastic electronic uh, with a plastic cover and electronic board inside. It's identical whether it's lawn or back net, just one little chip change. So um, these devices, when we ship them out, we ship them out all pre-programmed, ready to go. Um, and minor adjustments you can make through the thermostat, like maximum airflow, minimum airflow, those sort of things, you can adjust through the thermostat. Typically, they come back to a what we call a front end, where you can make uh, all the adjustments through a, through a PC. So, real quick, just talk a little bit more about BACnet and what that is and what that means. Um, well, BACnet is the uh, current industry standard for building automation. Um, it is backed by ASHRAE. So, uh, as 20 years ago, most of the control systems were coming out where this lawn works, uh, which stands for local operating network. It's a good product. We actually, we actually personally like it better than BACnet because it, it just always seems to work regardless of what's going on. We always said it, it'll talk on a piece of barbed wire. We're, <laughs> <laughs> we're BACnet. If you go over 3,000 feet of wire or you get your polarity reversed or you don't get your address set right or the baud rate's wrong, they, you can spend days chasing it down. Lawn works just, it doesn't care about polarity. There's no addressing. It just always works. Uh, but but back net, as you can see, ASHRAE. it's backed by <laughs> ASHRAE. So almost all engineering firms today are specifying their systems to be back net. Um, back net stands for Building Automation Controls Network. So almost everything we see today is, is back net. But all of our devices are available in both lawn and back net for, for whatever it's worth. The rest of the world still uses lawn works, but here in America we have ASHRAE, so <laughs> back nets. <laughs> Right, right. Uh, well, it's, it's right. Uh, it is what is it? That's what it, it is. It is. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, uh, as far as backnet goes, from an engineer standpoint, or from a, from a, a design, not design build, from a, um, I'm having a brain fart. Engineering. An engineer designed the system. Uh, when they say they need it to be backnet, most of the time there's going to be a control specification. Mm -hmm. They're going to have a spec book. They're going 230900 to have 230900 and it's going to be involved. It's not mm -hmm. just going to say, make it magnet. Right. <laughs> like it's, it's going to be involved. And that is where Joe's division of Jackson Systems comes in, in terms of making a system do what that spec book says. Uh, so just keep that in mind that, you know, you might hear an owner of a building or, 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 a, or someone say, well, does it need to be magnet? Well, <laughs> that all depends yeah. <laughs> on a lot of factors because it does add significantly to the complexity of the job. Is that absolutely right? so? If you need it to be low cost and simple, Z two thousand. If you have to meet a backnet specification, it's the Distech product or somebody else's. All 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 good products. Um, we were just discussing earlier that. Uh, this box is really not what it's about. Everybody makes a decent box. We like our blue Distech box, but it's it's really about the the people who help you get it installed, right. get help get it set up, and and we really do have a great relationship with most of our contractors. If you want to be involved with it, we'll let you be involved at whatever level you want. If Dave Moore, who was in here earlier, if you want him to draw it out and you install it, and we work together to program it, no problem. We, we'll we'll do whatever you guys want to do. Right, right. So, so everything from completely turnkey to to as little involvement parts. as you want us. Parts yeah. and smarts. Yep. Part, there you go. So, so this brings us to our next question. And this one, for, for some of you, it won't make a lot of sense. For some of you, it will. Uh, what is RTU open, and is it the same as BACnet? So I'll let you guys think about that for a second. Let online think about it for a second. Um, I will tell you that RTU open is, if you don't know what it is, it is in the name itself, RTU, meaning rooftop Top. unit. And open, you guess what that means. You, you think about that, what it, what it could mean. But RTU open, if you're not familiar with this, is something that you will see on specifications quite a bit. You will see on rooftop unit specifications or notes on the schedule for rooftops about to be provided with, roof, with RTU open. Yep. And we're going to have Joe answer this question <laughs> and then tell you his opinion. <laughs> so, Joe, go ahead. So RTU Open is Carrier's BACnet. Actually, it'll do BACnet and LawnWorks both. 
uh, it's their way to take a, a carrier rooftop and make it back net. Uh, Mike's kidding us because we've had a lot of trouble with them and it's become a, uh, a, a relatively <laughs> big deal to pull them out and stick in a disc tech controller in their place. And my son made a, a plaque that hangs in my wall now that says, friends don't let friends use RTU open uh, because the failure rate's about 50%. So, so what, what I always say, and I just want to point out in this training, is that if the engineer has specified uh, a gap, or sorry, I almost said that wrong. If an engineer has specified RTU open with his equipment, and you would like, uh, us, or th they have also specified a backnet system, don't do that. <laughs> Let us provide the controller for the unit instead of an RTU open uh, controller from carrier because it will, it will work if we do it. <laughs> it won't, <laughs> in most cases, the other way. So that was really the reason for that question was RTU open is not our friend. It is not a good thing. Um, it it, it co further complicates the system. Well, one of the things that we do is um, I, I worked for the train company for a long time. And if you bought a train Voyager rooftop, especially in the early days, you know, it had a room sensor on it. It didn't have RYGW, the things that we're all used to putting a meter on and seeing what's going on. So if that unit wasn't working, it was difficult to tell why. Uh, and the same thing happens today, whether it's carrier or train or whatever. Uh, so if you use the factory controls, if you're really good with the train stuff, you can, you can diagnose their boards and things. But our rooftop controller wires right straight to a carrier or train or Daikin rooftop, RYGW. So you can quickly tell where the problem's in the control system, because you can put a meter between common and R and common and Y and common and G, and see if the rooftop unit's being told to run or not. If you walk up to a train Voyager and it's got a standard uh, three-wire room sensor on it, or train precedent, whatever, it's got three-wire room sensor on it, you know it's in the rooftop because that's the only thing there, but you don't know really where to look. Uh, it can be difficult to troubleshoot it because you can't right. see it. Right. Exactly. So, All right, so we're going to move on now. We're going to talk about VAV boxes and just in general what they are and, and just give some clear explanation for some of those that might not know uh, the differences. So go ahead, Joe. Um, so we say there's two basic kinds of VAV boxes. A shutoff box, which is really just a damper. Right, um, up top. Upper left-hand corner there. Just a damper goes open and closed. It's still pressure independent, meaning it'll control the air flow in CFM to a minimum, maximum, and everywhere in between. Uh, but it just mostly opens and closes. So the next step up would be a VEAV box, shutoff box with heat. It could be hot water, it could be electric, staged electric, SCR electric, but still just a damper with heat behind it. Um, a step up from there would be a fan-powered VAV box. And they make uh, basically two different types. This happens to be a parallel VAV, fan-powered VAV box here. Um, it's parallel because the fan pulls air from above the plenum, and that's the first stage of heat. The air is coming in from the rooftop unit at 55 degrees, and it's, it's we'll say it's a 1,000 CFM box. It might be modulating between uh, 100 CFM and 1,000 CFM, depending on how much cooling you need. But if you need heat, it backs it down to 100 CFM. The fan kicks on, pulls warm air from above the ceiling. Now we're mixing 100 CFM of 55 degree air, plus maybe this is a 500 CFM fan. 500 CFM of 74 degree air from above the ceiling. So now we're putting out just slightly warm. This one happens to be a hot water coil. Uh, so if we still need more heat, uh, we start opening the hot water coil and, and heating the air up to 95 degrees or so. So the fan is actually the first stage of heat with a parallel fan powered box. And then this could be electric or hot water, whatever you want. Uh, but the airflow is still we call this the primary airflow. It still comes from the rooftop, the air handler, whatever. Uh, typically, is cold, cold air. Um, we don't have a. Uh, we don't have a series. Well, that's so there's also, yeah, it doesn't show you the inside of it. Yeah, it series fan power. Oh, let me let me back up. The amount of air that comes out through this VAV box and ultimately out through the diffuser changes in volume. It changes based on how far open this damper is and whether this fan's running or not. So the air volume actually changes. They also have what they call a series fan powered box, which we don't see in Indiana as much anymore. This fan is actually in the airstream. And this fan, if this is a 1,000 CFM box, this fan is moving a 1,000 CFM all the time. It's in the main airstream. If this damper's at its minimum of 100, it's going to pull 100 from here 
and 900 from above the ceiling, the amount of air coming out of the VAV box never changes. The temperature changes based on how far open this is. So we're always moving 1,000 CFM. As this open and closes, uh, it, it actually changes the airflow out here. Um, does, that, does that make sense? I know it's a little overwhelming. So parallel, the fan only runs when there's calling for heat. A series, the fan runs all the time because it's sitting in the airstream and the amount of air coming out of the, out of the VAV box does not actually Change. vary, even right. though it's a VAV box. So uh, most of the time, at least here in Indiana, we see parallel fan powered boxes um, and we see shut off box. We tend to see shut off boxes uh, in interiors. Uh, we tend to see more uh, fan powered boxes on the exterior of the building because you get a lot more heat out of them. Um, also, there is a dual duct VAV box. We don't see very many dual duct VAV boxes anymore because you have to run two duct systems. Right. So uh, they tend not to be uh, economical to put in. They, in the 70s, uh, there was a lot more of them around. Um, so I would say a majority of them are shut off and then parallel fan sure. powered. Right. Either way, you've got, a, you've got a controller that varies the amount of airflow uh, between minimum and maximum. All right. So. Um, we're going to keep going there. So that's boxes. That's the actual air devices. Now we'll talk about some controls. Um, so all of our VAV box controllers, well, for the most part, they, they look like this. If, if they come with specified stickers on them, they look like this. But <laughs> they're virtually the same, the same thing. Both of them uh, include a uh, Belimo damper actuator. Um, they're available in both lawn and back net. Um, all of these guys are... Uh, programmable, they'll do a shutoff box, hot water heat, electric heat, right. fan powered, non-fan powered, it doesn't matter, they'll, right. they'll do all the different types. Um, as far as con equipment controllers go, um, it doesn't matter what type of equipment, we can control it. Absolutely. So it could be pumps, it could be whatever, it doesn't matter. We can, we, can, we can write the code to tell it to do whatever we want. So this is a 650 or is this a, no this is a 253. Yeah, so, small one. Um, we have options that have a display on them, as far as the controller goes, uh, or we have them that do not. Um, obviously, there's different in difference in price there. Uh, the screens make it very nice because you can cycle through and you can see exactly what's going on. Um, you one, of the your one of the really cool things about this is um, I, I consider myself, for the most part, an air conditioning guy. So when we set one of these up, first of all, we work really hard to put them in layman's terms. In HVAC guys. Yep. Uh, you know, a lingo. So if, if I'm talking about the fan on a unit, I put the word fan control. It's, it's what it means. And, and if we're looking at the status, whether the fan's actually running or not, we call it fan status. At every point, you can, you can if you want to force the fan on, you can highlight it, push the button, and tell it to come on. And then it reminds you that you overrode it by turning itself purple. Sure. These guys are really, really easy to use. Um, you probably will have a little bit, of, need a little bit of help programming them, setting them up the first time. We'll be more than happy to help with that. Um, the programming is not the hard part of controls. Uh, I, I never touched a computer until I was halfway through my career. Mm -hmm. uh, the hard part is air conditioning. What is the unit really supposed to do? And it is, um, <laughs> it is amazing that um, even some engineers just don't know what the unit's really supposed to do. We'll see a sequence. Uh, that says, well, we saw, one, we saw one today that said the, uh, the building automation guy was supposed to modulate the TXV to control discharge air. That's not a thing. Uh, I've personally never seen or even heard of a TXV that I could electronically modulate. Now, some high-end equipment will let me vary the um, demand signal to the condensing unit, and it'll vary a variable speed compressor or something but there's no electronic expansion valve that they'll let a building automation guy get into. So we see that a lot. So yeah, the, real, all the, the real key to having a good building automation system is understanding your guys' job. Um, so right. that, that's always a real challenge. I think we have a, a really talented group here, uh, but a lot of time we need your help to make sure we understand what you think it needs to do. And I just want to reiterate your point about points. Um, the, the, the very funny thing, like with our product that's specified that we make a back net VAV diffuser is the points list. It's hilarious because we will get this request immediately. I need a points list and we'll provide a points list. And the points list is literally discharge air temperature. 
you know, uh, set point adjustment. Everything's in plain English. Everything's in plain English, and they always go, oh, okay. Because they're expecting it to be 1478-FP6, whatever. So we're, we're, that's, we're very cognizant of the fact that this needs to be very clear and simple and easy. Uh, and, and Joe's group does a great, great job with that. So I um, wanted to point that out. So, Joe, is there anything else to add other than um, we will make custom panels? We do it all the time. We do it all the time. We will help with custom sequences if you're doing a design build or if the engineer doesn't know what he's doing. We'll, we'll help with that too. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. going to start on that tonight. Yeah, we're going to figure that one out. We, we always tell our customers, if you can write down what you want the system to do on a piece of paper, we can write the programming. The programming for this stuff is actually really, really easy. Um, if they can teach me to do programming, they can teach anybody to do programming. And we, we do a little, uh, a little four-week four class in the, uh, uh, we'll probably do it again in the fall now. If, if you guys wanted to do that, we could teach you how to write the program for this. It is, it is not like, uh, it's not even, it's not even a, a basic. It's not if this, then this. It's here's, a, here's what we call a thermostat block, and here's the room temperature, and here's the set point. You plug all those two together, and you draw a line between them, and it controls the cooling stage one. Right. Um, and because we know that you don't want to short cycle the equipment, because we're all air conditioning guys at heart, we put a minimum on off time in there, and we put anti nice short cycle time in, timers in it, which is just another little block we drag on the page. So easy to program. Uh, sometimes it's a challenge to, um, to do everything everyone wants because the equipment's just not designed to, to uh, we see it, also we see it, Voyager rooftop, it tells us to run the DX cooling and if the, uh, if the humidity's too high, turn on the gas heat. Voyager rooftop from train will not let you do that. Um, we see it in specs to do it all the time. Sure. They needed to pick the equipment with the hot gas reheat for dehumidification, right. not turn on the gas heat. Right. So um, that's, that's usually the challenge with, with most control things. It's, a, it's limitations of equipment. All right, so real quick, we just want to check online. Does anybody have any questions, or is there anything we haven't covered thus far? We are going to hit on uh, a little bit more here. we got about maybe four or five more slides uh, before we, we, we wrap up. But we want to make sure if you have any questions that you, uh, you, you send those through to us, and we'll answer them for you. Okay, so uh, next here, we're going to talk about just you know, multiple zone VAV systems. That's just a really basic drawing of one. But um, in particular, I want to point out that with any VAV system, it's not out of the box. I there, there is yeah. not an out of the box solution for a VAV system. There is not. Um, there can be parts that are out of the box, but we got to do some programming. So go ahead with that, Joe. Well, a typical VAV system for us would start with, you know, let's look at some plans. If you don't have plans, at least let's figure out what's in the building. Mm -hmm. uh, our head of engineering, Mr. Dave Moore, does uh, beautiful control drawings that anyone can understand. We always tease Dave. He can't decide if he wants to be an artist or, right. a, or an engineer, uh, which don't typically go together. But Dave's control drawings are real easy to I'm understand. I'm going to jump in on that. I've actually had engineers ask me to ask Dave to dumb his drawings down because they make their drawings look so bad. <laughs> because they're so artistic. It's crazy. Like he, he puts gradients and shades and it's, it's ridiculous, his drawings. So he's a very talented guy. So, uh, and, and Dave uh, has been doing this for a long time, but he, he can put together a control set of control drawings that's easy for everyone to understand. It doesn't mean that they don't need a little bit of explanation just because you may not be familiar with uh, this controller or whatever, but, but he makes it real easy to use. Uh, typically, um, for most of our customers, unless it's a big project, we do what we call parts and smarts, which means Dave draws the, the drawings for you and uh, one of our Text might program everything for you and meet you out. You can install this stuff. There's no reason you can't. Um, we can ha help you with everything from the type of wire that BACnet requires or the type of wire that a, a room sensor requires. We can help you with all those things. You can put this in. You can be successful. You can run the building. Um, we'll support you. We support all of our systems free forever as long as you have an internet connection to them. So. If you put in a building and five years later you're having trouble with a VAV box, it doesn't mean we'll come out and service it for free. We won't. We'll come out, but it, but it costs. But you can say, hey, Joe, remember that job we did together five years ago? Will you look at one of the VAV boxes? I'm going to say, well, do we still have an internet connection? You're going to say, yeah. I'll say, okay. At lunchtime, I'll go into McDonald's, grab an internet connection, 
Uh, we'll jump online together. We'll look at it. We'll make a decision about what needs to be done, whether we think there's a bad sensor or a bad controller or... Um, we can typically figure it out. We, we can help you get, get it figured out. You can, if it needs a new part, we'll get you a part. You can change it. So we can put you in the control business without too much trouble. Um, and, and you can be involved to whatever level you'd like. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's definitely varying degrees uh, of, of control. Um, it could be as simple as a backnet VVT system or as complex as a um, chill water, hot water, uh, air handler. Um, so I think the largest project we've ever done was Plainfield High School. Mm -hmm. At the time we did it, it was the largest high school in the state of Indiana. Um, and I think it has 215 VAV boxes and I don't know, 20, 20 air handlers mm -hmm. or something. It has uh, 300 tons of uh, air cooled screw chiller. Uh, I think it has 10 boilers, uh, variable uh, primary flow on the chillers and, and variable flow on the boilers. So really sophisticated system. Um, it, uh, so no, no job is too big, and it's not unusual for um, we, we just, I, I'll, especially, I one of El, especially one yep. of Ellen's customers <laughs> to say, hey, I need one valve. Right. And so anything from a single valve to a... Well, to I, was gonna, I was going to jump in and say well, today we did one uh, with, I did one with Joe's uh, son, Ryan, today, where it is, it is just one VAV controller that they're retrofitting, and they just wanted one but they needed it to be programmed exactly like all the other ones that are already there. So we just programmed it with the same algorithm and sh shipped it out and that's, it's done. So we can do little tiny stuff. We can do big stuff and we can even do weird stuff. We, yeah, I come up with all kinds of weird stuff for Joe to do. Um, so we, we, we've, we've, we've created wild products and crazy things that, that I never would have thought we would ever, we've created fan controllers and building pressure controllers and, all kinds of stuff. So uh, nothing's too small, nothing's too big for us, in most cases at least. I won't say nothing is too big. Uh, we were asked to quote a job in New York City that was, was it 900 boxes? 900 and something boxes in, in a 78-story in a building. We would have had to actually move people to New York. So <laughs> we said no to that one. But Well, that was not the biggest one. The biggest one was the embassy. That's right. That, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> we got asked to quote the embassy in Russia. Was it? Yeah. Yeah, it was in Russia. Um, we thought about it. <laughs> and no one wanted to move to Russia. And nobody wanted to move to Russia. <laughs> for three years. <laughs> oh, well, then there, there was the one in uh, the Middle East somewhere, too. Yeah. Yeah, that one was a no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pass on that one. Um, but I uh, wanted to also just point out from a, a monitoring standpoint, we get asked for that a lot. Uh, we can monitor it. It's no problem. We can provide monitoring and data logging if, if, if that's asked for or required. It's kind of built in. Yeah. But I mean, just that without control. Oh, yeah. True. So we can do yeah. that too. Um, we can even do access control. Uh, we can we can do lighting control technically um, if we needed to as well. So we got a lot of different different hats we can wear with the control side of it. Um, and then um, I point out again there equipment uh, <laughs> factory controls. Um, again, you're going to see that specification that says provide with factory controls. Um, in most cases, we would ask that that doesn't happen. The exception is if it's a VAV rooftop unit, there's no way to do a VAV rooftop unit without factory controls. So right. you have to roll with that. Right, exactly. Okay. Next up, I'm going to take this part real quick just because um, as a salesperson, I deal with this constantly. Um, and that is plans from engineers. So I throw up here on the screen, uh, in particular, uh, threw up a layout and then also a schedule. Um, this is mind-numbingly frustrating, and I'm sure for most of you that ever do takeoffs, it is. The engineer will draw it properly and then put a schedule together that is not remotely close to what he drew. We always make this suggestion on that, is always look at the schedule, but always go to the plants and highlight, draw, circles, whatever you got to do to make sure they match. Never rely on the schedule only. This happens all the time with reps that I deal with. Happens all the time in terms of, okay, I got my schedule. My schedule says there's 18 VAV boxes. Except for the fact that there's 18 different types that are all typical. They think there's 18, there's actually 74 of them. <laughs> you know, So always check 
both to make sure. I know it takes time. Uh, I, I, I know it does. But you can get hung out to dry really quick if you don't check both the schedule and the actual plans themselves. So um, I pointed out, you know, usually the, they look like this. So you see here there's VAV boxes right there on the screen. Um, for those here, they're the, the highlighted. They actually call them out VAV, and it tells you the CFM that needs to be flown through that box. Um, the, uh, the schedule here is actually a good schedule um, because it's laying out exactly the numbers. So if you can find those numbers real quick, you'll, you'll know that you're right. Uh, if it was typical, th this might still be here, but they could all be... <laughs> They could, there could be 10 of each one of them. So you don't want to get hung out to dry. You quote it, oh, there's only you know, 12 VAV boxes total, and then you, you come time for bid day, and there's 37 of them. Uh, you don't want to get stuck with that. So uh, just keep that in mind um, when you're determining quantities and you're doing a, a quote. Um, and, and we will always be happy to uh, help you in that process in terms of controls. You know, we're not going to just do takeoffs for you so you can figure out how many boxes there are. But if you do need controls, we will look at, we would, we would, be, we would prefer to have the plans so that we can look at that and see what, what, what the options are, what, what we might be able to provide and, and get you the best number we can. Okay? So, Joe, anything to add on that? Yep. Okay. Moving on. Uh, if there is any other questions, let us know. We're almost to the end here. So, uh, we wanted to really quickly point out something that you might come across quite often, uh, depending upon the parts of the country you're in and depending upon how old the buildings are you're working on. So for those of you that have been around for a while, you'll recognize that thing. Joe, we left the dust on it for you. <laughs> it's, what, it's what we call new old stock. <laughs> Never been used, but it's been on the shelf for 15 years. <laughs> Uh, so, pneumatics uh, is what we're going to talk about real quick, just, just a brief few minutes here. Um, so, jo Joe, uh, we don't see this installed as, as the controls of choice anymore. No. Um, but when we do come across it, what, is, what are we doing with it? Uh, well, we did uh, three pneumatic VAV boxes up in Fort Wayne uh, in the last uh, month or so. We tried to talk them out of it, but the building was all pneumatic, so they wanted to stay that way. For the most part... Uh, if you have a pneumatics job, and if it's very old, the uh, system tends to fill with water and oil from the air compressor. And uh, for the most part, what you're saying, we've got to change it over to electronic, whether that's as simple as a, a zoning panel, mm -hmm. um, or if it's more sophisticated, we do it with DDC. So we can help, we can help clean up any old pneumatic system that you run across. It's not a problem. Uh, if you have old control drawings, that's helpful to help us get it all figured out quickly. If not, we can meet you on site and go through it and, uh, and decide what, it, what the best choice is for getting it cleaned up. Um, we don't do pneumatic service. If we happen to sell some pneumatic VAV box controls, we'd help you get them, we'd get them set up. Uh, I'm the only one in our group that's old enough to remember how to do them. So <laughs> uh, uh, for the most part, uh, they're obsolete. Mm -hmm. Still in a few hospitals and things, but right. for the most part, we're switching it over to electronic. It's much simpler, especially if you're going to use a zoning type product. Sure. Uh, and I think it's important to point out, in a lot of cases, in almost every case, it'll be roughly the same price or or a lot less to replace it and make it electronic. Um, and that's because these just really aren't made very much. They're, they're limited. Uh, KMC is really the only people still... Um, uh, yeah, Johnson's does. Yeah, some stuff. Johnson's still for yeah. some old old yeah. uh, hosp hospitals and things like right. that. And so, but there's there's not a lot of it out there. Not a lot of people that know how to do it. So uh, just keep in mind that in most cases, if they are looking to retrofit the building, it will actually be a, a lesser involved uh, installation and cost if they switch over to electronic. Especially if you have an air compressor that's right. running. You have leaks in the building. They can be difficult to find. They make compressors run a long time, which causes them to pump oil, which destroys the thermostats, and, and causes them to uh, also uh, water in the system from a faulty air dryer or something like that. A, lo a lot of maintenance on an air compressor and an air dryer and all those things. And if they're not properly maintained, the pneumatics just won't work. Sure. For, not, not for very long. Sure. All right, so moving on from pneumatics, we're going to talk about hydronics just a little bit. Um, so 
I always look at hydronics as not really, as a general simple statement, not really that much different than standard zoning, standard air side zoning. We're just controlling a water valve versus a versus an air valve. But Joe will get into much more of it because I don't do controls for, for hydronics and Joe does. So um, go ahead, Joe. Um, well, for the most part, all of our valves are made by the Belimo company, uh, as our damper actuators are too. Um, so if you need hot water reheat, hot water for baseboard, um, hot water for the coil in a VAV box, we have the, the Belimo uh, valves and, and damper actuators. Um, but we can help with hydronic systems of all types. We have a pretty good understanding of uh, hydronic hot water systems and uh, probably even more so on the chill water side. Mm -hmm. um, we understand, you know, how a hydronic system for a chiller works. We understand that if you don't get somewhere near half the flow through the, uh, through the chiller, that chiller is probably not going to stay online. If it's variable primary flow, that adds another layer of, layer of complexity. If they make it primary secondary pumping, it's a lot simpler, but they got twice as many pumps. So um, all of those sort of things we can help with. Uh, so if you have systems that don't work very well, we can help you help point you in the right direction to get uh, your hydronic systems working again as well. So that's hydronics. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, just wanted to point this out. I, I put this together because I was being silly and I like to give Joe a hard time. So um, with this tech and with Jackson or other controls that we might need to use, uh, we can do it. We can help. We can make it happen. We can do all these things. We are very, very good at figuring out your problem and helping you to get the solution that you need. And that's what all that means is we're here to help you. Um, and we want to help you be in the controls business. Um, as a company, our job is to provide you with the expertise that makes it happen so that you can then learn from it and utilize that moving forward. And we'll just give you parts and you can just make it happen and go make money. So, uh, Joe, is there anything to add to that about what you guys do or uh, that that's, kind of covered that's, it? That's pretty much it. All right. Yes, sir. Why would you want to do that? No, I'm just kidding. Yes. So real quick. The, the answer why is you're <laughs> right. Just to, why. just to, so everybody else knows what the question was. The question was uh, interfacing uh, or integrating disk tech controls with uh, a JCI medicine system or a carrier Siemens. system or Siemens. Siemens or It doesn't matter. Anybody else's controls, right? So Joe, go ahead. Um, so uh, we know our limitations. Uh, everything that we do, all of our disk tech controls, I'll use a product that's called Tritium. Tritium is the industry standard for open systems. They use BACnet, LawnWorks, all those sort of things. But it is the standard that, uh, that a good portion of the contractors around the country use. We'll, we'll mm -hmm. do our best to support any system that's based on Tritium. Uh, I have no way to get Johnson Medicine software. They will not sell it to me. Uh, I spent 15 years with a train company. They will not sell me Tracer Summit. The good thing about Tracer Summit is uh, myself, Dave Moore, and Dustin Petticord all came from the train company. Uh, we know the train product line pretty well. Um, our, our challenge is we can't get their software. They, they, my old boss um, doesn't like me anymore, <laughs> uh, so he's made it clear that I'm not allowed to have any of the, that software. And so um, uh, if, if you take me into an old Johnson Medicine, especially if it's really old stuff, the, the N2 stuff, uh, we just don't have any way to integrate that. The, the tritium box will talk in too, um, but we just don't have the, uh, there's kind of two pieces to it. There's the tritium, the part that we all see, the, the web pages and the pretty picture, but the stuff that goes on behind the scene uh, is, is difficult. So it is not unusual, well, we did it at NDOT and Seymour this the week. It was a Honeywell system, but it was based on tritium. They wanted to stick new rooftop units in, and we did the integration down into, um, a Honeywell uh, tritium-based system, no problem at all. Uh, but we don't we don't attempt to do Siemens Apogee or uh, or Johnson Metasys. We we just don't have the expertise or the software to do it. Right. It's 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 also with their proprietary piece to it. Even if we could, in a lot of cases, the owner forgot their passwords. And, you know, and it's, so you got that problem as well. So. 
Um, sure. So I, I think the other thing I'd add to that is um, DISTECH is extremely open in terms of its ability to communicate. So um, if they start out with a DISTECH system, you don't have the same problems as Joe just talked about in terms of, you know, closed. It, it, their software is open. They're, they're, you're, you're able to, to add to it, to change it, and it's not a, 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 a wall immediately like it is with JCI or, or some of the other guys. So this is another thing to point out from especially a design build situation. If you're working with an owner of a building and they want to put in a system, BACnet gives the, or sorry, DISTEC gives them that uh, open platform that allows that to happen. Well, it's, it's actually Tritium. Tritium and we, yeah. we always tell our customers, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you use DISTEC or not. If you start out with a Tritium platform, which when we buy Tritium, it says DISTEC. If you buy it from Honeywell, it's called Webs. If you buy it from Johnson Control, it's called Building Explorer. If you buy it from the train company, it's called Link Springs. Uh, so it's everybody, awesome. every, everyone has it. If they start out with that platform, no matter who they use, um, they'll always be able to get service. So they put in a system, let's say Johnson Control does a job and they put in the JACE that says uh, Explorer. Building Explorer. Let's say that Johnson overcharges them every time they come out and they want somebody else to service it. That's fine, not a problem. If they have a bad Johnson controller and it's back net, I just grab mine and throw it on in its place. They don't, they're not tied to me, they're not tied to my product or, or Johnson in, that, in this case. Um, if they start out with a Tritium platform, mm -hmm. they're never tied to any one contractor or any one brand of, of products. So just tell your building owners, base it on Tritium, base it on BACnet, then after that, it's all about the people doing the work. Right, exactly. Okay. So we have come basically to the end of this uh, highly educational and I'm sure entertaining uh, uh, training here. But uh, the last uh, thing I want to say is uh, if you would like more commercial training and specific training, um, you know, we can do training on valves. We can do training on you know, how to wire, the, we plan on doing training on how to wire our system up. But if there's specific commercial products or specific commercial applications that you would like training on, let us know. Okay, we will, we will, we will look at doing that, that training for you. Um, we all, we, for those of you that are here, you know we love doing training at Jackson Systems. Um, and so we're, we're happy to do that and provide for that. So um, going forward, Joe, is there anything else to add or? I just want to make sure everyone saw our, our big ass yeah, zone damper. Oh, oh, it, it just came in today. It's a 32-inch uh, round damper in comparison to our uh, four inch our 4-inch zone damper here. <laughs> uh, I just th just thought it was interesting, so I, I brought right. that up. It's 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 a big old round damper. It's as Joe put on their sign his sign there. That's a big ass damper. Uh, <laughs> with, with that in mind, uh, we'll 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 go ahead and, and end it. Um, from there, we thank you for participating. We thank you for joining us. Uh, and as we mentioned at the beginning, this will be available starting tomorrow at the same link that you, uh, you got here with uh, from, from, uh, from the web. And uh, thanks again for joining us. We'll see you on the next training. Thanks so much.